We're just using these mics because it's being recorded. I know it seems a little bit ridiculous <laughs> since you guys are like sitting in our living room, but um, let's just roll with it and uh, let's get started. So uh, thanks everyone for coming out uh, who came to see this and for everyone for being here. Um, we just had another panel a few minutes ago uh, with a lot of the represent a lot of representatives from local theater groups. And uh, it was a really good discussion. Got a, got a lot of people on the ground, uh, folks from Riverside Theater, ICCT, City Circle, Dreamwell. Um, I'm probably forgetting someone, uh, working group. And so you know, we're, we're not doing the exact same conversation here, but uh, we're doing something similar, which is just, it's, it's fun, I think, every now and then to kind of like touch base. There are a lot of artists working in a lot of different mediums in our area. Um, and everyone's always, you know, like doing their art 24 seven or doing their job and then doing their art. Um, and then trying to sleep or not sleep. And so I think sometimes it's just good to just kind of find a time when everyone can just get together and just talk um, and, you know, just take like, you know, an hour before they go back to the, to the daily thing. Um, <clears throat> so the, the nature of this panel is about uh, the independent artist. And uh, I, tr I tried to pick four people who are doing their own thing and are doing it in Iowa City or, you know, close to Iowa City and for some reason are in this geography and I don't know if there's anything there, but, you know, at least to kind of like raise a question, you know, is there something about doing your thing and being in this town? Um, and, you know, what are the ups to that? What are the downs to that? Um, what are the challenges and, you know, what are the positives? So uh, I'll do brief introductions, but these folks are going to tell you a little bit more about themselves. Uh, we have Stan Crocker all the way down at the end here, and uh, we have Sandy Dias, and we have Sean Reed just back from Australia, I believe. And uh, Dave Zillow was supposed to be on this panel, but he came, he's very ill. He uh, has a, some weird strain of the flu, and he's getting better, but uh, he, it just didn't make sense for him to come out and do this this afternoon. And so he's been replaced. Uh, last minute by Adam Havlin, who is another musician and has also a wealth of experiences, so I think we'll do just fine. Um, but if you guys want to just do your own introductions real quick, just so we have a sense of who you are, and, and then we can go from there. Do you want to start, Stan? You know, I, I, um, I heard Andre speak uh, at the beginning of a Pieta Brown fundraiser at the mill about a month ago, or about a year ago, and marveled at how articulate he was, and now I'm absolutely terrified that I have to follow him. <laughs> because he did it again. But um, my name is Stan Crocker. I've, I've spent the last 25 plus years as a uh, lighting designer and set designer for um, uh, live concert tours, live music television, comedy TV. I, uh, I spent a lot of time flying out of, El uh, out of Iowa, unfortunately. I was hoping that the film credit actually might change that. And unfortunately, that took a, a nasty turn. But um, I moved here with my family seven years ago, kind of a return to the roots uh, for myself and my wife, Susan, who's a, a painter. Um, we had started out in Minneapolis and moved out to LA to kind of uh, allow me to spend more time with my then six-month-old son, who I wasn't seeing enough because I was commuting constantly. And at some point, we felt free enough to move somewhere else. And uh, having visited Mount Vernon for, uh, for a couple of years in Iowa City prior to that, when our friends lived in Iowa City, we were very much drawn to this part of the world and made this our, our move. So we've been here about seven years. It means I commute constantly. I'm flying off all the time. I'm perpetually jet lagged. I can relate to Australian jet lag and what you must be feeling right now. And I'm feeling very grateful that I'm not at that sp in that headspace at the moment. But um, I started out uh, like, you know, like a lot of lighting designers um, on a career path towards uh, becoming a nurse anesthetist. I, um, I was, uh, I was bent on the idea of a health career, and I got into it, uh, got into the educational part of it, the, uh, the, the, the electives, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the pre-nursing courses to it, and realized I had no scientific aptitude at all, and an intro to theater class kind of turned me off into a new direction. Uh, got very lucky, right place at the right time, I've had a very successful career at that, and along the way, I learned a lot about art. I was kind of self-taught in art history and, and, uh, and 
got turned on to a guy by the name of Joseph Cornell, an assemblage artist, and was fascinated with his work and could relate to it on, you know, as a pack rat who had an attic full of stuff. I went, I went home after seeing his work and started doing assemblage pieces. And at some point, you know, it's, it's probably not surprising that I introduced light into those assemblage pieces. And um, at another point, about four or five years ago, I had this idea that I wanted to create a bigger, a bigger piece, an installation. And that opportunity presented itself at, at Cornell College on, at Kimmel Theater. Uh, through a set of circumstances, I had a couple of weeks available to me there and almost simultaneously found out about a grant the Iowa Arts Council with support from the National Endowment for the Arts provided um, called the uh, Major Works Program and, um, and was able to, to get that grant, fortunately, and use that with the space at Kimmel and, and realize this uh, installation piece called Drift. And that, for me, was a, a major turning point in establishing this other creative side of, of me and what I, how I want to uh, go through life. And uh, so that's where I'm at right now. I've succeeded in getting this one piece up. I've got two others ready to go. And I'm feeling really good about that direction and feeling really good about the role Iowa has played in allowing me to explore that. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> um, my name is Sandy Dias, and I used to work for Public Access TV. Um, one of my many careers. Uh, my entire life has been in Iowa. I do travel, but I have lived in Iowa since I was born in eastern Iowa on a farm where my parents still live. And I love it here. Um, I do love to travel, and I get jet lag when I do it. Um, I also love Joseph Cornell's work, and had no idea who he was until I went to undergrad art school here. I got my MFA at Iowa in intermedia and video art, and um, I started out getting married at age 20 and having two kids and starting a portrait studio when I was 23 in Bellevue, Iowa. Um, that experience being there, I don't know, until 87. I think it was about 10 or 12 years of living in Bellevue. And um, I was married most of that time, but not all of it. And that experience of running a portrait studio taught me a million things. It taught me, um, excuse me, it taught me how to work with people, it taught me how to do portraiture. Um, I had no prior schooling other than going to Kirkwood for two years in the graphic arts. Um, I knew how to do paste up and layout. And um, I just jumped into the portrait business in Bellevue, Iowa because I needed to make some money. And friends of mine said, you're really good with taking pictures because I'd had a camera in my hand since I was a little girl. So I decided, OK, there's an idea. <laughs> so I jumped into the portrait business and was very successful um, at it. Little by little, I was able to make a really, really good living, probably better than I make ever since I left. And, but I, at, at about oh, the end of my 20s into my early 30s, I started getting really this sense of restlessness and boredom knowing that I had sort of conquered what it was that I wanted to do, and I had succeeded, and I was coming back down to a plateau. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. But that plateau is comfortable, but it's not challenging. And I decided that I was young enough to take on another challenge. So I moved to Iowa City with my daughters. By then, I was divorced. And I moved here and started a new life in 1987. And I went to undergrad, and then I got my MFA, raising my daughters. And um, I met all the musicians that are in my book, Down to the River. I met them. Some of them I met in Dubuque. I met Bo Ramsey and Radoslav and Sonny Lod and um, Bobby Thompson and all these guys. I met them in Dubuque when I was living in Bellevue. So I kind of. I had a head start, but I had no idea that a book would ever happen. And 
while I was going to undergrad here and getting my degree, I started, you know, I love music. It's probably the number one inspiration in my life is music and always has been. So I was taking pictures at all the shows I went to just because I wanted to. And also sometimes I, you know, a musician would ask me, Dave Zolo, or someone would say, hey, will you cover tonight? Uh, you know, I need some photographs. So anyway, um, in 2007, my book was published. But prior to that, I talked to Holly Carver, who um, was the uh, editor at uh, the University of Iowa Press. She was 1,000% supportive and spurred me on and got me going. And thus, the book was published. And I just want to say that if, you, if you're doing something that you love, whether or not you're really getting paid for it or not, I mean, it's, it's kind of a labor of love. I had no idea that that book was going to ever come about. I never even thought about it. But if you're doing something you love, I think, I think things um, follow. No matter what it is that you choose to do, I think you have to love it. Um, so anyway, here I am. I'm still going out to shows. I'm starting to see a new uh, influx of new music in Iowa City, which I think is really, really cool. And I'm also a visual artist on top of photographing musicians. I, you know, I do lots of photos. So anyway, I'm gonna wrap up. But that's where I am presently. I also teach photography and um, uh, performance art at Cornell College. And teaching is extremely rewarding to me. I absolutely love it. So that's it. Here we go. Yeah, I'm Sean Reed. I grew up in Muscatine, so just a little ways away. I started coming to sh Underground music gigs in Iowa City in the mid 90s. Pretty much as soon as I got my license, I started driving to Iowa City to buy records and go to shows and that sort of thing. Um, and that, you know, when I was a kind of preteen and teenager, that, you know, like uh, underground music was something that came into my life and really sort of had a big impact. And in a way that I never thought about when I was young, has had a big impact on, you know, my career and everything like that. Um, from a young age, I was really interested in visual arts. That was sort of always the thing I was really good at was visual art. And unlike some of my friends and stuff who were into art and music, um, not being very encouraged by their family or their peers to pursue that, I was always very um, sort of like pushed to be an artist because it was always the thing that I was really good at and I gravitated towards in my you know, family and a lot of teachers and stuff sort of really pushed me towards that. Um, so I always sort of knew that I would be involved in visual arts in some kind of way. And it wasn't until, until later that I sort of figured out how to uh, mesh my ideas relating to visual arts with ideas relating to music. Um, I went to the University of Northern Iowa and got a printmaking degree in, I think I graduated in 2004, 2003 or 2004. And um, during my time at UNI, um, it's a small school and it's just kind of a small town and I was there at a really really good time where there was a lot of other people they were sort of like making art but also really interested in underground music and had were sort of coming from this particular era of you know underground music related to you know punk and hardcore and noise music and sort of experimental music so during that time I you know on one hand I was in this sort of academic environment and then I was also getting this other education with my friends, like starting a venue, uh, a DIY venue, getting inviting bands to come play, like starting to go on tours, starting to put out our own records, you know, making zines, getting sort of like getting into this, you know, like self-publishing, self-promotion thing, and trying to build this scene basically out of at the time, which was like nothing, sort of. And at that time, I was also coming to Iowa City for shows, and there's kind of this statewide you know, underground music scene of people that were my age or a little bit younger, a little bit older. Um, and during that time when I was at UNI, um, I would, collected like zines and underground comics and I was ordering a lot of records and that kind of led me to this life of correspondence where I would correspond with people from kind of like all over the, started to correspond with people from all over the country and all over the world, like 
bands and record labels and other artists I was interested in. And th through that, I actually ended up um, coming into contact with a curator from New York who um, curated at a gallery in New York and curated at a gallery in Japan and Tokyo. And she ran this store as well that sort of dealt with like basically just like underground comic books and silkscreen zines and that sort of thing, self-published kind of stuff. And I started ordering stuff from her and uh, when I would, she became very inquisitive towards like who I was because I was this person from Iowa, this state that she didn't have any idea that there was really people like me interested in this really niche stuff. So um, she was really open to the idea of like being, you know, she's just interested in what my deal was. So um, we started, you know, we kept corresponding and I ended up sending her artwork of mine and videos I was making and, you know, albums we were make you know recording and things like that and she ended up actually sort of taking me under her wing and started to curate me into these show my visual art into shows that she was doing um in japan and in different different uh things in new york and other parts of the u.s and europe and um, eventually led to me having a solo exhibition in japan a solo exhibition in new york and just a lot of opportunities in sort of the the art world um and around that time, I was, I was making a lot of stuff that was sort of a hybrid between printmaking mediums and sculpture and textiles, embroidery, um, drawing, like all, just, just a bunch of different stuff. Um, and I was really interested in the idea of like being, you know, trying to make it sustainable, you know, figuring out a way where once I was done with school, I could be sort of like a career artist and not have to work um, another job. Um, during that time, Around, well, I finished at UNI and I ended up going to grad school at the University of Iowa um, and was in the intermediate department. And one reason I decided to go to school at Iowa as opposed to leaving was because I had this group of friends that I was very active with in terms of making music and making art and collaborating with and just you know having these sort of bonds with, with some, some peers of mine that I knew that you know, if I left, I might not be able to replace very easily. And when you're playing music and playing in bands and that sort of thing, it's, you know, people that, there's several people here that also make music and you know that, you know, once you find people that you can do that with and have that kind of dialogue with and that kind of communication where, you know, it becomes easy to make music with them and be creative with them, it's, you know, important to try to maintain that to, you know, sort of keep doing what you're doing. And so that's one reason why I stuck around. and. And one reason why I've still stuck around is just because of a few friends that I have that I make music with. And, um, uh, and I ended up in this band in Iowa City called Raccoon that was never very well known in Iowa City, but got a lot of opportunities to put out records and tour the U.S. and tour internationally. And, you know, we'd play festivals in Europe and that sort of thing. Um, and that led to a lot, of, lot more opportunities in terms of the music and visual art and stuff like that. And during the time I was in that band, the members of the band, we sort of collectively decided to start a record label that would sort of represent uh, music that we were making on the side individually and also other music for our friends from Iowa and Iowa City and people we were meeting on tour because a lot of the, there wasn't a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of record, there wasn't, at the time there was, there wasn't really a record label or a scene or anything like that to represent what we were doing. So we just sort of figured out that we had to do it ourselves if we wanted to make it happen. And at that time, the label was sort of a collaborative venture that wasn't that serious. You know, we'd work on it seriously, but it wasn't like something we were, you know, trying to necessarily make sustainable or anything. It was just a way to put out um, our friends' music. And through all that, we kind of ended up in this niche of it's kind of like thing of underground sort of cassette culture, like cassette label stuff and vinyl records and that sort of thing. And that's sort of what I've always been involved with is this sort of underground, um, just like community of people that are interested in vinyl records and cassette tapes and all these antiquated mediums. And that's like a whole nother conversation that I could get into explaining like why that exists and all that sort of thing. But after, you know, we did that band for a few years really seriously and toured a lot. You know, sometimes we, I'd be on the road like four or five months a year. And um, at a certain point, that band 
folded just because we'd kind of done everything we wanted to do with that band aesthetically and people from the band, some of the members of the band wanted to get out of Iowa City and live in different places and pursue other things. Um, and around that time, I was just going through a big transition in life in general, and I was really trying to figure out, I just finished grad school, and I was, you know, I had been doing all these art shows, and had, you know, had a solo show in New York, and had a certain moment, amount of momentum in the art world or whatever, um, but I just didn't really see it as something I could do sustainably, like it wouldn't really pay the bills, and it really wouldn't even pay for the material costs or the time that I was putting into it, and I knew you know, I just finished school, my TA position, all that stuff had dried up and I was, you know, basically broke and I was going to have to figure out what I was going to do, whether I was going to leave Iowa City, move to New York and try to, you know, really go after existing in the art world or, you know, start a new band and try to tour and do that sort of thing again or just, just what I was going to do. And um, since I'd been touring so much and had had this experience with putting out our own records and meeting lots of people around the world that are involved in with record labels and touring and underground music, I decided to try to do the record label full time. And so I basically took over the label that had been a collective thing and just started, you know, took any little bit of money I had and started putting it into it and trying to turn over that money and um, establish like better distribution for the label and putting out things more seriously. And around that same time, I started a new band called Wet Hair with um, one of the other members of Raccoon. And we continued on the same path of, you know, spending months a year touring and um, recording albums. And that's pretty much, you know, where I'm at now is um, running a record label full time, constantly pushing that in different directions and new territories. Um, I've done over 150 releases for bands from all over the world. Um, and, you know, we've toured a lot, just got back from a tour in Australia. Um, and are constantly like recording and putting out records on uh, my label and other labels. Um, and I still do the visual art thing. Like we had a, actually just had an art exhibition in Newcastle in Australia. Um, I do a lot of collaborative work with one of the other guys in the band. And we had a, recently had a show, an art exhibition in Montreal as well. So we, you know, I still do that stuff. It's just I don't pursue it as actively since the label takes up most of my time. The label also has a very distinct like visual aesthetic um, that ties into, I basically do all the artwork for the label and it's all silk screened and it has a very particular sort of aesthetic design element to it, which has helped the label sort of stick out and gain a bit of notoriety, so. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm, my name is Adam Havlin. Um, I was born about four blocks away, Mercy Hospital, um, but I grew up in West Liberty. Um, from, the, from a very early age, uh, music was definitely um, encouraged at my house. I always fell asleep to, to uh, Brahms or Vivaldi or Wagner. Uh, thanks, Mom. <laughs> um, and I picked up, um, actually my first performance was uh, when I was about two and a half years old. I uh, sang in front of a church. Uh, my uncle was a pastor in Muscatine and he I had a mini guitar and I sang Jesus Loves Me. <laughs> that, was, that was my first solo show. <laughs> um, I picked up saxophone in fifth grade when West Music came through with all the different instruments and I went with it. I wanted to play the drums but um, there was no room in the house and I don't think anybody really wants to hear their kids learning to play drums in the house but I guess some people do that. Um, so I, I went with the saxophone I played saxophone um, all the way up through high school. Um, I taught myself to play guitar. I really wanted an electric guitar, a really big, ugly, like met, super fast metal guitar. But m my parents got me an acoustic instead, <laughs> wanted me to learn the right way. And uh, I started playing drums when the kid that normally would play uh, the trap set for Pet Band um, was gone and they just needed somebody to fill in and I'd never played drums before but I just kind of sat down and did it. I'd been banging on, you know, tables and stuff with pencils and getting yelled at in, in the middle school for it. So I don't know, it just kind of came naturally. Um, I went to university here, started out in computer science and then I switched over to uh, MIS, got an MIS degree from Iowa here. 
and finance degree also. But I didn't really do much as far as the music scene was concerned in college. Um, and that all changed after I got out of college. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be involved in the music scene here in some, some fashion. So uh, meanwhile, I, was, I've, I think I've worked every single job that Iowa City has to offer. <laughs> Um, currently, I work overnights uh, at a place that manufactures synthetic DNA, um, but I've been a mover, a bartender, uh, a line cook, um, I don't know, basically just kind of living paycheck to paycheck to support the fact that I'm playing in a band. Um, I, I've, much like Sean, I've toured um, the United, most of the United States. Uh, I haven't gotten internationally, gone anywhere internationally, but uh, I played drums in a band called Death Ships for a while. They got some modest success. We went on tour with uh, uh, Jay Bennett, who was in Wilco. And uh, now I'm playing, singing, guitar, singing and playing guitar in a band called Emperor's Club here in Iowa City. And yeah, that's where I'm at. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, so you guys all have kind of different experiences here. But what are, what are some of the things that like really keep you here or make you proud to be here? Or, are, or maybe there are not things that make you, <laughs> maybe you're not proud to be here and maybe it's on, it's on, the, on the other side. But of course, you know, you, you've, you've got your like homes here, you've got your friends here, you've got, you know, your connections here and it's just like, it, it's your home. Um, whether, you were gr whether you grew up here or you made it your home. But um, what are, I mean, do you wear Iowa City as a badge or do you wear the area as a badge? Um, or is it just, it just happens to be just the, the spot you're in? Do you identify with it? Well, I guess for me, like touring and stuff, people ask about, always ask about it, you know, because Iowa is like, it's not, I mean, I, describe me as exotic maybe isn't the right term, but <laughs> people, people definitely have like, they're like, oh, Iowa, like it's, it's odd, you know, it's like a band being from New York or a band being from LA or like those really common places is like, no, they're never going to get asked about that, really. But if you're from Iowa, like, it's always been a thing with everything I've done musically and artistically. And even when I was doing visual art, like, I was sort of, like, you know, always in the write-ups, there would be, like, this thing about me being this Iowa person, you know, and trying to exotic, make it exotic in a way or something. <clears throat> when, I, uh, when I first left L.A. and moved back to the Midwest, I was a little afraid that, I'd, you know, I'd established myself out there for five or six years. And, and um, I was really, I was frankly concerned that leaving was going to cost me income. And so I kept my 323 area code cell phone that established me as being one of the locals to LA. And I just didn't, if I didn't, if I hadn't socialized with a producer, a director, a manager, I didn't tell them that I left. And for a year, <laughs> none of those people knew that I was living, you know, thousands of miles away. And then I got the point where I realized it was making me a bit schizophrenic. I didn't know who knew and who didn't. And I <laughs> realized it was starting to have a really bizarre impact on my conversations with clients. And so I just outed myself. It's like, I moved to Iowa, and I feel really good about it. It's been a good move for me. And the, the reaction was surprising, because a lot of the people that, are, that I work with that are LA-based or New York-based um, had that same kind of dream to kind of go back at least close to where they were, or to go somewhere different. I mean, just like, you know, to be able to break free. That's not to say that LA and New York aren't great, because they are. There's wonderful things happening there. But they, they aren't the only great. And, and there's all these places like Iowa that are really wonderful places to make art and to come home to and to raise families in and have friends at and have this sense of community. I find Iowa to be a very supportive community creatively. Mount Vernon and Iowa City in particular, but I know that that's true elsewhere. I mean, there's just, there's so much going on. There's so many people doing great things. Theater, writing, you know, music all the way, all the way through. So I find that Iowa, you know, it's, it's been currency for me. It's, it's good to be able to say, my, well, I am the odd guy out. Very few sentences start with, in my industry, start with, you know, I live in Iowa and it's been good. Uh, since I have only lived in Iowa, Part of my questioning um, to myself has always been, maybe you should move and get that experience of living elsewhere. And I haven't done it. I did move here because I felt like this was a very good artistic community with lots of music and 
um, opportunities to meet other people that were doing things like I did. I would not move back to where I grew up. Um, I have the option to do that in Jackson County. That's Maquoketa, Bellevue, Sibula, all those little um, towns. But I don't feel like the community is big enough, and I don't even feel like it's big enough in Dubuque. But I do like Iowa City for that reason, is I think we do have a strong community here. I'd like it to get stronger. I was talking to Andy. I'm very interested in having a film house here um, because I, I watch movies all the time. Um, and I'd like to be able to go to a place in Iowa City and see art house or independent films with other people because I enjoy doing that. Um, I'm, what I'm trying to do, I guess, is I've applied for Fulbright. I was an alternative last year, and I reapplied this year. So I guess that's the way I'm going to get out of Iowa and experience other places is by visiting and by hopefully finding a residency or a grant that will allow me to live somewhere else for six months or a year, and then I'll come home, and I call this home. So that's, I guess, my two cents on it right now. Well, especially for, I'd say, you two guys, um, you're kind of at that point, I think, you know, in your early 30s are about to be there. When Sandy kind of made the decision that she was going to say, I mean, you know, I'm going to cut from this life I have now and start again and try something new. And so for you guys kind of being at that cusp where, you know, where you can, you know, you, you, people say you're still young enough to make a decision, but maybe you can do that, you know, for your whole life. Um, and being very involved, especially with the music scenes here in, you know, in different ways, you guys are part of a scene. Do you ever feel a tension that, you know, if I were to go to New York, if I were to go to Chicago, go to San Francisco, that I would, you know, in a way be kind of like, you know, letting go or, you know, kind of maybe even, you know, destroying or partly, you know, letting down the scene that you've been important in creating and building? I think, I mean, the major reason I've stayed is just because I've been so busy in a way, you know, it's like, I mean, literally, like, it's like, in order to move, I would have to, because my house is like, a, I, I, don't, I don't have a job, I just do the record label full time and play music and go on tour and make artwork and do design stuff, so, but there's like a very thin margin of money with that, you know, so, like, it's really hard to save up money when I'm constantly putting out records and I'm trying to make the label, you know, bigger and more active at, all, at all, all the time, you know, so I'm constantly just putting all my money back into it and never really saving much money. Um, and just like living in a place where I can live for, you know, my house is 800 bucks a month. I have a roommate, it has a silkscreen studio, a practice space for the band, like recording set up for the band, like has basically everything I use in life, you know, in one space, which, you know, in a lot of cities I could not, there's, you know, it'd be really hard to find in a lot of cities the same space for the same dollar you know so that's something that i'm always thinking about um and so I've, I've stayed for those reasons and also because you know i have this creative connection with other people so i would sort of have to those things would have to end and dissolve or i'd have to we'd have to figure out a collective way for a couple of us to move together which then you add like romantic relationships <laughs> that people have into that and individual financial situations, it just becomes really complex, and then you're going on tour all the time and doing all these things, you know, it's, it's hard, it just becomes really hard to move, you know, this is like a really easy place to live. Um, so it's like, it's difficult, but on a lot of, if I'm gonna be honest about it, on a lot of personal levels, like at this point, you know, turning 30 this year, having nothing to do with the university at this point, um, being a lot, quite a bit older than a lot of the, like the average age, sort of in the town, <laughs> it feels like. I mean, I know that's maybe not true, but it does feel like the town's like predominantly dominated by 20 year olds, you know? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just not where I'm at all the time. So um, sometimes it's socially, it's a little bit, you know, it becomes difficult and also creatively because, you know, culturally the town's so dominated by the university in terms of what it does and what it's about that being a townie or being kind of an outsider to that can be sort of feel sort of isolating. And with what I do, it doesn't really matter where I live in a way because I have distributors that distribute the records and stuff all over the world and people order the stuff on the website and I 
correspond with all these people and I'm always going on tour and I'm gone a lot anyways but it's it is a it is a weird issue and it's probably like Iowa City living in Iowa City whether I should stay or where if I should go in the last probably four or five years has been like the predominant kind of like crisis in my life you know uh, which is I don't know it's sort of funny you know I uh I don't know I think I get excited by the fact that there's people that are here, um, the university, the, the kids are here for the first time in their lives, they're, they're free, they're, you know, like, this is, you're an adult now, here, let's see what you can do with this sort of thing. And I hope that it, as a songwriter, I can offer some sort of, you know, hey man, it's okay, don't be scared about it. Because, um, it, you know, being an adult for the first time in a, in a college town is, is kind of trying, but, um, there's always people there to listen to your music. It's really easy to start up a band and just go here in Iowa City too. I mean, they have the open mic at the mill. I think all you gotta do is call Jay and you have a slot, you know, with a couple weeks notice. So if you have a voice and, and you have something to say, all you have to do is make a phone call. I think that, that, sounded, yeah. like an, that sounded like an infomercial or like <laughs> set it and forget it or whatever, but. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of plugging plugging the open mic thing, but I mean, I think it, that was one cool thing about you know growing up in Iowa and having an idea of like this. You know, we have a very similar background, you know, and like we're we kind of run with a lot of the same people in town and in the same circles and stuff. But you know, it, it was it, it was nice to have the opportunity to create, be involved with people to create my own situation or our own situation and. That was definitely, that's always been something, you know, cool about living here compared to, you know, if you're a musician or an artist and you live in a place like New York, it's sort of like you have to work to get invited maybe a little bit more than you would of just creating your own sort of situation. And that's just a very different, different thing, I guess. So um, this might pertain most to Stan and Adam. I know you you guys have jobs that like, you know, you have to be committed to, you know, you're on a work schedule or, you know, I just know from talking to Stan before, you know, sometimes he'll just get a call and he's, he's got to get on the plane and get out there and do a job. Um, but then you also have this thing that you're creating in the other hours where, you know, for you, Stan, if you're working on a new installation for Adam, if you've just got to get like a new set of songs out, how do you guys kind of like work that balance between, you know, paying rent and also, you know, being able to create your work and get that work, you know, presented or showcased? Well, I, I work it very poorly. I don't have, I have no answers. I wish I, I could say I've got that so sussed out at this point in my life because then I give hope to the 30-year-olds in the room. But, but the fact is, I, uh, you know, I, for one thing, I work a job that has just bizarre hours anyway. I mean, it's not unusual for me to go for two days without sleep and then get on a plane, come home, power crash, wake up, and I'm a father again. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's bizarre. It's, I switch time zones. I switch continents. I... I, you know, work overnight in theaters and venues, and then and and then try to get back to this real world that I live in in Iowa, and that real world in Iowa is when I have the opportunity to um, focus on this other creative vein, you know, and, and this other thing that I'm doing, and they're both creative, and for that I'm really grateful that I'm able, able to actually make a living um, doing something creative, and um, but you know, finding that balance is just it's just hard. It's just you know. I, I'm in a seasonal business as well. I, I always look forward to this time of year because it's it's going to start slowing down now, and I'm home more often, and I you know see my family more often, and and I have uh, more time to step into my studio and start doing things that I've been sketching on on very sketch you know half dozen sketch pads the rest of the year while I'm flying around, and so you know I've I've found a balance, but. There's this part of me that wishes I could just stop doing what I do for a living and focus on the other creative thing, which um, unfortunately doesn't pay as well, but is immensely satisfying. I mean, if I had to, you know, look at, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been lucky. I've had a, a, a wonderful, you know, life doing creative stuff and getting paid for it and seeing the world while I'm at it. And yet, um, the thing that, if when somebody asks me, you know, what's what's the most satisfying creative thing you've done, it would be Drift, the installation I did last year. I mean, hands down, because um, it was just totally, you know, it was me. It wasn't, uh, there was no input from any pop stars or their managers or any producers or directors. It was a complete 
creative conduit from my head to the installation. And uh, sometimes I just wish I could have a lot more of that and a lot less of the jobs that, you know, that pay the, pay the mortgage. But I'd like that part edited out in case any of my clients <laughs> see that because I'm not encouraging that way of thinking. Um, I feel like I have a different answer because if it were up to me, I'd like to teach uh, more than I teach because to me, it's extremely rewarding, like I said before, and I would like to make a better living at teaching than I do because I part time. I think that's happened to a lot of people. And um, since I started late, because um, I was a baby boomer girl and didn't get my you know what together for a long time, I feel like I would you know I would like a full time career as a teacher, but what I'm finding out is that being a part time teacher, it's pushing me to um, work as an artist, and I just keep coming up with projects and ideas. So I have a lot of, I have three, currently I have three projects um, that I'm working on and soon to be maybe another one, I'm hoping. Um, but I, I would like to just throw this out there too. Because um, you're talking about you want to work more on your own with yourself and I would like to work more, I would like to have more collaborative work. I started out when I came here to the University of Iowa, my area was theater. Um, I wanted to be involved with the theater, and it just did not work being a single mother. It just did not work. <laughs> so I switched to Intermedia and was involved. I loved being there because it was always collaborative and you're always working with other people. And, you know, if anybody can give me more of that kind of work, I like that. I don't so much like working as just an individual artist. I'd rather be more collaborative. And I think that's why teaching works for me, because I'm always working with students. And I, I get so high from doing that, it's crazy. I just, I'm fed by it. So. I try to convince myself um, almost every day that being uh, a touring musician and having a, um, like a professional career aren't mutually exclusive, but I find that um, you're kind of, it's hard to find a, a balance to find a, a career that will allow you to leave town for any more than a week or two at a time. Um, you know, you've got X amount of paid time off and, you know, finding, I actually had to quit one of my uh, computer programming jobs in 2005 to go on tour because I couldn't get a an unpaid leave of absence from them. So I find it dif difficult. I feel like I'm kind of resigned to working, you know, the kind of jobs where you're just allowed to take off whenever you're on. Your boss is cool with that. Um, but those those are hard to find. So I um, just want to make sure that we have an opportunity to open up. Do you, are there any questions from folks out there? Any any ideas that people wanted to get at? No ideas. Okay. Um, so how do you guys feel? I mean, you work in different scenes, uh, different art forms. How do you just feel about, you know, the various scenes, the various art scenes, kind of like the strength of the culture in Iowa City? Like, do you think it's a vibrant time? I know, you know, Sandy, you just the music that, you know, first kind of got you going is, you know, maybe like the, it's like the generation that's not on the way out. But, you know, like, but those are, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? That, that, that's, that's not meant as a slight. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a different scene, you know. I feel like I am on the way out. I mean, not that I was ever in, but like, <laughs> like, like Sean said, you know, you you turn thirty or whatever, and it just it's a younger town, and it, it's it's their time, and that's cool. It's just, you know, that's how it goes. So, but it, but how do you guys feel about the very scenes that are happening here right now? I mean, do you, th do you think it's vibrant? Where do, where do you think uh, you know the town needs help, if if anywhere? I think like once I got done going to school here, um, in terms of like visual art, like or maybe the kind of visual art that I was involved with, like making installations, like sort of art with a capital A, like art for art's sake kind of art. Um, like I don't really feel much community for that outside of the university and being disconnected from the university. Like there's not, there's not really like a, you know, and I don't, I'm not, I don't wanna knock any galleries or anything like that that do exist here, is that I just don't really see the kind of gallery or space or, sort of community for like 
art with a capital A outside the university. And maybe the town just isn't big enough. There's just not enough people um, around to support that or sustain that. But I, you know, and I think in Des Moines, there is a little bit more of a presence for that. And I think the Des Moines Art Center has a lot to do with that. Like I've, sh I've shown at the Des Moines Art Center and there's other kind of galleries that smaller commercial galleries that are facilitated around that, that have the sort of art with the capital A that I'm trying to describe. But I do think that that's maybe kind of a weakness because I don't, you know, people will ask me about that when I travel and stuff. And I sort of say like, I don't really have any connection with like visual art in Iowa City, um, which is kind of unfortunate. I do wish I had more of a dialogue in that in that vein than maybe exists here. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, there are a few galleries, and I am involved in one gallery, but that art with a capital A, and yeah, I think that this town could definitely use another space, Andy. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, we're never going to have the, and I would say we're never going to have the spotlight that places like LA and 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 New York have. You know, people aren't ever really going to be looking to Iowa City for for like as the next scene, whether it be visual art or music or anything like that. But I feel like that makes what we do um, a little bit more personal. We don't really get caught up in any particular art or music like movement in particular or style I, I feel like um, we've just kind of everybody just kind of does their own thing and it's like no one's trying to climb the ladder right the yeah whereas no ladder to climb, really. right <laughs> right like in 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 big areas with a big scene like that you know all you all you do is you just kind of jump in the river and go with it whereas like in Iowa City or in the Midwest, it seems like it's more of a little little trickle of of information or or uh, influence, I guess. I was gonna say when you were talking to both of you were talking about the music scene here, the young music scene. I'd say in Iowa City, this is just my um, guess, is that the music scene is the most vibrant community that I know of, far beyond the visual arts scene. Um, and that's why when I was involved directly with it, it was so exciting. And I feel like I'm kind of out of the loop half the time when you're not involved in the music scene. It's like people say, well, aren't you friends with a lot of visual artists? I said, no. And they said, well, you know a lot of musicians. I said, yes. But I do feel that the music scene is the only main creative scene that people know about. I'm envious of it because you know, you can play at the Blue Moose upstairs or the Mill or Gabe's or um, any one of those venues and you get people out and people, there's a community there and it's exciting, I think. Um, um, go ahead, Stan. Well, I just, I just want to say that, um, you know, I, I live in Mount Vernon and for those of you that don't know where that is, it's, you know, a good 35, 40 miles away. It's incredibly far away from here. Takes me, takes me a whole day to get to Iowa City, and um, you know, it, it, for a while it was just I'd come home, I'd go to I'd go to Mount Vernon, and I'd go home, I'd get a, you know, come in from wherever I came in, I'd fly through Cedar Rapids and and go home, and I was kind of a hermit out there for a while, and those are good times. And in fact, that's when I was doing a lot of my smaller assemblage pieces. I was just going crazy with that stuff. But um, I, at at some point a couple of years ago, I, I really started to tune into Iowa City, which I'd always felt the pull of and felt connected to, and, and would go to for you know for for that part of the culture and culinary thing that I couldn't get in Mount Vernon. Which, by the way, I should make my own infomercial here that Mount Vernon's got that going on too. But. Um, I, uh, I became aware of the scene here, uh, the art scene, the music scene, the theater scene, and all that, and, and felt this, this desire to be part of that somehow and to connect to it. And because of the reality of being you know, a, a father and having two young kids, I'm, I don't have the kind of time that that, you know, that, that demands, but felt that pull. And I wanted to say, you know, you know in, in, in that case, I was looking for a kind of collaborative thing. Um, that comes back to what we were saying earlier about collaboration. Um, when I said, you know, I look forward to that focus, that, that singular focus that I've got when I come home, there, um, that's because so much of my industry work 
you know, working in the, in the industry that I'm in is collaborative. You're collaborating on all levels at all times. And I find that very satisfying. It's, it's one of the things I like about lighting and scenic for the, you know, live music industry and, and live television and all that. Um, but it is something I've wanted to find here. And to a degree, even with Drift, you know, I need to give credit there is that, although visually that was, you know, that's, that was me and, 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 and my need to get that out there. I collaborated with a musician, a longtime friend of mine from Minneapolis, Rick Meyer, who, um, you know, it was great. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to do something that had nothing to do with music when I did the installation. Just because I spend my life, you know, interpreting music, you know, visually. Right, that's what I. That's a big part of what I do, but I didn't want that to to be what dominated my art, and um, and so. But at the end of, at the end of the of the installation, I was just the silence of the room was driving me crazy, and I, I realized I needed music on that installation piece, and so I went to my friend Rick. I called him up in Minneapolis, and I said, you know, you know, if you got something, and he had this perfect piece that became part of that installation and completed it for me. And so that collaboration there, and by the way, the satisfaction of knowing that the music came after the visuals was, very, was important to me because he was kind of interpreting what I did visually instead of me interpreting what he did musically. And I have done that for him back in the Minneapolis days my, you know, when I worked with his band. Um, so I, you know, I like the collaborative process and I feel it here in a way that maybe other people, you know, I mean, I, I feel the, uh, the, um, the creative opportunities in this town and in ways that other people may or may not see if they're in the midst of it or if they're f even further from it than I am. But I'm putting out an infomercial here, too, that I'm looking for collaborative opportunities. I, I guess that's what I'm bringing it around to right now, is I would, I would love that. Uh, maybe uh, I'll play devil's advocate. Um, maybe going back to something that uh, Adam might have started saying. Um, I, 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 think there is, I think there is you know, a sense of you know, Iowa's culture and I say it's just, you know, because I grew up on the East Coast and then, you know, lived in California before making this my home. And, you know, you, you want to talk about, you know, the musicians. Like, I knew who Greg Brown was and that there was this idea of, like, you know, Greg Brown and Bo Ramsey before I moved here. At the time, it wasn't my particular thing, but I used to have a guy who lived in the apartment below me and he used to collect these records. And, like, that, that was his thing. He would, like, come home and listen to Greg Brown. And I was like, you know, I, want, I wanted to listen to something else at the time. But, you know, they, but that's what he was into. And I was at the mill... Um, a few weeks ago and this band Vetiver from San Francisco came and played and they were loading in their stuff and the first thing they did was look at that picture on the wall um, where it's like Greg Brown and Bo Ramsey and kind of like Dave Moore and, and they were like naming all the, all the guys on the wall and that was like their thing you know and they were having like a, a total like you know kind of nerdy folk moment amongst themselves um, which and everyone else in the room just kind of chuckled and laughed at them and then like you know they went on and set up their gear and, you know, and then even by the same token, I'd say, you know, Sean, I know some of the bands that you've put out, um, and maybe it's just part of a trend that's happening right now in, in popular music or indie music or underground music where, you know, stuff is getting brought up, like, you know, like a band like Peaking Lights, you know, getting signed to Domino and you having kind of maybe, you know, being friends with them and, and appreciate their music maybe long before the greater mass had, you know, now they're going up to, I don't know if it's a, up to another level, but they're going to some other place. And even Dirty Beaches, I know you've worked with before, and you know that's another person who's starting to get like a lot of notice now. And in some ways, I feel, you know, I just because I work a lot with agents, they start to come back. And you know, I'll have these conversations sometimes where people are like, "Well, what is this Night People Records thing in Iowa City?" And of course, again, it comes back to like making it exotic. <laughs> like they're like Night People Records. <laughs> like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so I think there, you know, you, you know, you're saying maybe there isn't a scene here, and. Of course, like scenes are created by journalists, and you know it's just like a way for us to kind of put things put, to put things in boxes. But uh, but I think some things do get out to people who aren't you know necessarily from here or living here at the time. That wasn't really a question; that was a point, I suppose. <laughs> and and, and I, I guess people can argue with that. Interesting how that can work, you know, just in the sense of like mythology in this you know in this way of the. You know, we people people like like the story and they like the mythology. So that's one thing about living in a place like Iowa City that you can use to your advantage, or that you know, there's people that try to create that mythology, or the mythology is created by an audience from the outside that knows nothing about it. You know, so and in certain ways, that's definitely factored into like what I do with the record label and the bands I've been in, and you know, 
just even like when I was showing a lot and that sort of thing, like the exotic nature of being this person from Iowa and it being like in this sort of unknown thing to people, you know, a rural state, like it's like uh, Ohio, Idaho, like every, if you, if you go to foreign countries, like people think Ohio, Idaho and Iowa are all the same thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, like it being, um, yeah, it's just like, it's just interesting how all that works out, you know, with, with being in a place like this. But at the same time, Iowa City, I think, is pretty, you know, it has its own thing compared, you know, it's a distinct place within the state because of the university, because of the, you know, the size of the university related to the population of the town. I mean, the university is a big, big factor here. And, it's something I was trying to, when I was in Australia just recently, I just got back a couple of days ago, and I was trying to explain to people like the college town phenomena in the United States, because there's other places in the world where that doesn't exist. Even countries and cultures that are very similar to ours, like Australia, uh, college life, college towns don't exist, and it's sort of like its own niche where, like I think Adam was saying earlier, where it's, it is this place in a positive way where it has reoccurring energy, so there's like you know, thousands of new people every four years and then other people leave. So, and even in terms of like, you know, academics, new academics coming in and out, graduate students, all of that sort of stuff. And um, I just sort of wish that there was like, even when I was in grad school here, I had trouble identifying with some of the academic life because I sort of felt more connected to this like music and art thing outside of academia. And um, I don't know. I don't know how that could be reconciled more. I think there are certain, certain, maybe there's certain towns where it's reconciled a little bit more than it is. Like I know the University of Iowa used to do gigs where like Scope would pay for more kind of like smaller bands. They'd come play or they would, they would fund like the local music scene. It'll be a little more tied into university funding of, you know, gigs and shows and that sort of stuff. And there's other universities where that's, it's almost a thing on the touring circuit if you're in an indie band or whatever, where you're, you're, you're booker, your booking agent, or if you're your own booking agent, you're trying to get like the college money. Um, and sometimes, you know, in a lot of those towns or schools that have the college money thing connected to uh, independent music and that sort of thing, uh, maybe bridge the gap a little bit more between the school and the academics and what the students are interested in outside of that and playing in bands. It'd be interesting if there was a gallery here that had art with a capital A, and it would obviously intersect with the university because there's a lot of art students, and you know this is a big literature town and writing town and all that sort of stuff. So, how that could, you know, I'm just sort of curious if there could be more of a way to bridge the gap between the townies and the, the university. Before I forget it, I was thinking while you were talking, um, there's. Uh, reading The Little Village again the other night, um, I was reading about uh, the fact that they hired um, a consultant for $50,000 to come in and Iowa City to say, oh, we need a lot of chains downtown. We need those name brand things. And um, I think that's absolutely wrong. And what we need is more of a niche for what Iowa City is. And I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And I have one more thing, and I know it's probably a little off the target besides having a film house. I also have another idea, and I'm on PATV. <laughs> I have another idea. I went to see the Roller Girls about a month ago out at Marriott. I know I'm getting a little off the topic here. But Hot was playing, H-O-T-T. -T. It was an amazing scene, and I, can envision having a real roller derby, not right downtown, but somewhere around here that would also offer a space for alternative music, art, so on and so forth. I think that's the kind of thing that people come to Iowa City for. I don't think they come here to shop at, um, what's one of those name brand places? Yeah, I don't think that's why they come here. You can go anywhere and shop there. I think the reason, people come to Iowa City is because of the Englert and places like um, that are real and really connected to this community. Um, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there. If anybody knows anything about getting an investor 
to invest in for the, and I'm not even part of the roller derby thing. I just think it's really cool. And I think they need a place, okay.